Good morning, everybody. My name is David Marsh. I'm the chairman of OMPFIV, and it's a great pleasure today to introduce Luis de Guindos, who is the vice president of the European Central Bank, who's going to be talking about the situation in the economic and monetary union area. And this is a particularly propitious time because uh, Mr. de Guindos has just come back from the Venice summit of the G20 finance ministers uh, and central bankers have been talking about the economic situation uh, in the light of the pandemic recovery. We also had slightly earlier than some people have been expecting the conclusions of the ECB strategy review last Thursday. There's a lot to talk about. Mr. De Guindos has been the vice president since 2018. Uh, before that, he was the Spanish minister of economy and finance and for a while industry from 2011 onwards, coinciding with the period in, indeed when Mario Draghi was the president of the ECB. So he knows a lot about recovery. Uh, he presided over a great recovery in Spain after the ravages of the great financial crisis. Before that, he had a spell in banking and he was also uh, way back. studies and committees on finance and competitiveness. So he's got a very, really, very exhaustive track record. Uh, first of all, uh, Luis, welcome to OMFIF and thank you for being here today. Can you tell us about the mood music at the G20? Uh, is there still an overall worry about the Delta variant holding back world recovery? Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much to Amfi for you know inviting me to this uh, to this event to this event. Um, um, good morning to everybody. Well, first of all, I have to say that I was not in Venice. I was not uh, you know in the in the G20 meeting. It was only the the president. It was only uh, Christine Christine Lagarde. You know, but uh, uh, well, I think that uh, they have uh, they have uh, given an indication about uh, you know the, the the economic recovery that is fully aligned with uh, you know our projections and the projections of the of the european the european commission so uh, what i would say is that uh, you know rebound in the euro, the euro activities and the way uh, thanks to the improved pandemic situation and rising confidence uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, cross country heterogeneity uh, for instance in the case of germany uh, we expected to reach uh, their per crisis GDP level one year earlier than others, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of Spain or the case of, uh, of, Italy, of Italy. Uh, the reason behind is uh, the relaxed uh, distancing measures that are boosting household spending and activity in the services sector. And uh, also investment is foreseen uh, to accelerate. Uh, we see risks uh, to the growth outlook as broadly uh, balanced. But uh, we should emphasize that vigorous policy support remains essential to limit the scarring effects and reduce cross-country uh, heterogeneity. Uh, the spreading of virus mutations in some EU countries shows that we should not be complacent about the observed rise in confidence, but continue the path of pol policy support. Labor market indicators uh, point to employment growth ahead. But uh, here, let me say, let me stress and emphasize that uh, unemployment, the unemployment rate is not a very good indicator about the dynamics of the, of the labor market. Uh, we should look at uh, uh, employment and total hours because they remain substantially below pre-pandemic levels. And only once the policy support will fade out, we will see the need for labor reallocation across sectors more, more, more clearly. Uh, with respect to inflation, uh, uh, the surge that we have uh, observed, uh, you know, in the first half of this year, uh, according to our views, is going to be temporary. Uh, headline inflation is uh, now 1.9%, but we expect that uh, will be on the rise until the, the end of the year um, because of base effects uh, and temporary, temporary effects. Uh, uh, looking further uh, ahead as the impact of the pandemic fades, the unwinding of the high level of slacks supported by commodity fiscal monetary policies is expected to contribute to a gradual increase in inflation over the medium term. But uh, the risks uh, to the outlook for inflation seem tilted to the upside in 2021. In these regards, uh, and this I think that this is especially relevant, we will need to monitor very closely whether temporary effects on inflation become more stable and structural. For instance, in some euro area countries, um, as you know, uh, indexation plays an important role. So the adjustment of public sector wages and pensions to temporary inflation developments would need to be observed carefully. 
as this could give rise to structural factors of inflation. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, fiscal policies need to, to continue supporting the economic recovery also into the next into next year. It is uh, and it's uh, encouraging to see that potential productive government investment has increased its share in the stimulus packages as of 2021, mainly due to the new generation EU finance measures. As the outlook of inflation remains below our medium term inflation aim, substantial monetary policy stimulus remains essential. Uh, so in our last uh, monetary policy meeting in June, we decided to confirm our very accommodative uh, monetary policy stance. So these are, you know, our, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, you know, our, our. This is, uh, you know, a very uh, rapid summary of, uh, you know, how we see, you know, the outlook in the, the euro area that has been confirmed as well with the the, the projections that uh, last week uh, were released by the European the European Commission. So yes, uh, th thank you, thank you for those opening remarks, uh, Mr. Vice President. Um, as you say. Uh, a number of people do tend to think that the inflationary outlook might be less benign than others. I just want to go into the strategy review now, because the very carefully phrased wording showed that there was a lot of compromise in that statement that you made about the willingness to uh, tolerate for a transitory period a overshooting of the now symmetrical 2% target. How much work had to be done, would you say, please, to get that compromise between those on the council who are in favour of much more continued accommodation and those who are somewhat worried about too much easing? Did you have to make some compromises in order to get the necessary unanimity? Well, there are 25 of us uh, in the governing councils now, so we are quite a few and with different, uh, you know, sensitivities in terms of, uh, you know, monetary policy. But I think that, uh, you know, very rapidly, you know, with respect to the, the new definition uh, of price stability, I think that uh, a sort of consensus has started to, 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 to stir up huh? quite, uh, quite rapidly. Um, I think that the 2% symmetric uh, over the medium term it was a great, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, from the very beginning of our of our discussions, we had, uh, you know, a set of seminars. One of them, for sure, was dedicated to the definition of price stability. And I would say that very, 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 very rapidly, you know, this two percent symmetric uh, uh, over the medium term, uh, you know, uh, received uh, a lot of support and endorsement by the twenty five members of the governing council. So it was not very, very difficult to reach uh, an agreement. Uh, in, in that respect at all. It, I'm not sure whether you're still there. Yes, the, 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 you did, of course, in the statement, you did say that there'd be a willingness to uh, have the rate going above 2%. Nobody seems to be very keen to say how long this transitory period could be. Do you think it could be six months, a year? Do you want to be a bit more um, definitional about how long this period would be where you would allow a an overshoot for the 2%? Well, you know, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, the, the approach is much, uh, let's say, uh, qualitative than quantitative in terms of the, of the time horizon. First of all, you know, our uh, you know, our approach was quite clear. Uh, when you are in, uh, uh, in a situation close to the lower bound of interest rates, then your policy action has to be much more forceful and much more uh, persistent eh, than in a, different, in a different situation. And this uh, uh, may imply that, uh, you know, we can, we, we can tolerate eh, inflation uh, going uh, beyond eh, the, the, the target of, uh, of, uh, of 2%. But we do not have, you know, a, a concrete, uh, a very specific, uh, particular calibration. It will depend on the circumstances, no? So, uh, well, uh, you know, it's a question of judgment at the end of the day. So I could not, we didn't discuss it whether, you know, it will be, you know, three months, four months, five months, or three weeks at all. It will depend, uh, you know, on the, on the circumstances that, uh, you know, we are going through. But would you agree there is a difference between saying, we are actually trying to have an inflation rate above 2% or simply saying this may imply a transitory period. The, the 
wording chosen seems to be somewhat cautious, somewhat conservative, somewhat passive. No, it's totally, you are totally, 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 totally right. Uh, first of all, you know, what is important to stress, and this is something that was indicated by, by, by the president and it was implicit in our negotiations, is that we are not doing any sort of average eh, inflation targeting at all. Eh? No, this, is not, uh, this is not the case. You know, again, I repeat, you know, we are in the, in the lower bound. So uh, uh, in order to avoid the entrenchment of uh, uh, inflation expectations, then we can, we can act uh, uh, forcefully. And this may imply, you know, the symmetry of our objective plus the situation of the lower bound uh, may imply that uh, we accept, uh, you know, a temporary overshooting of our target of 2%. Was there much uh, forceful opposition to the idea that there should not be uh, average inflation rate targeting? I remember your good colleague and former finance minister, Oli Wren, has spoken out in favour of uh, an average approach. Uh, did many people back up Oli Wren in that uh, argument? Well, I would not enter into the discussion that we had, but uh, you know what I have to say is that uh, our definition of price stability was taken unanimously by all the members of the of the of the of the governing council, my good friend Oli Ren included. And what does this mean in practice, would you say, then, Mr. Vice President, for the operations? Because there's two interesting things. One is that Mario Draghi, as long ago as June 2019, did actually say that the inflation target was symmetrical, and uh, uh, Madame Lagarde pointed that out actually last Thursday. Um, and then she did also say that she didn't actually think this policy would make much difference to the actual time when you started tightening. So what difference does it all make? Well, first of all, what I have to say is that monetary policy is about evolution, no revolution. And there is a continuity in the ether of monetary policy. And I think that this is something that is quite, quite, quite relevant. So. Uh, if you look at our definition of price stability, there is a clear revolution according to the circumstances uh, in each moment of, the, of, uh, of, uh, of time. Uh, if you allow me to say it, in that, uh, you know, the, 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 the big, uh, uh, you know, changes in terms of the strategy review happened uh, in other areas uh, of, uh, you know, the strategy review uh, happened mainly. For instance, you know, there is something that, uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised, but didn't attract much uh, attention. Uh, that it was uh, that, that, that uh, you know, uh, traditionally we had two pillars of uh, uh, economic analysis: the monetary pillar plus the economic uh, the economic pillar, and we used to to to, to use and we used to to, to employ both uh, in order to decide uh, you know our, our monetary policy policy stance. And one of the conclusions of the strategic review, and it's clearly indicated there, but uh, you know, it, it has not caught in the eye of the media, huh? as in other parts of the of the of the of the strategy review, is that uh, the monetary analysis has been completed with financial stability considerations. So, in the new strategy review, we will have you know two two pillars or two analyses huh? that are going to converge. On the one hand, the traditional economic one. On the other hand, the monetary. And uh, uh, financial, financial, uh, financial uh, analysis or pillar, and I think that this is uh, an important evolution no? in terms of uh, you know the elements that we will take into consideration. It will not be only you know uh, the evolution of uh, money supply, let's call it plus economic situation. It will be as well you know we will take into consideration some financial indicators that I think that are going to be relevant um, in our proportionality in proportionality analysis whenever we take a decision in terms of monetary policy. So, for instance, you know, in my view, that was uh, that was relevant. Uh, uh, as well, you know, we had a sort of pecking order with respect to the to the instruments in our toolkit that we can use. You know, the, the most obvious one uh, is uh, interest rates uh, and the modification of interest rates. But as well, you know, we have indicated that we will use uh, forward guidance, that we will use uh, asset purchases, that we will use negative interest rates, that we will use. Uh, uh, as well, long-term refinancing uh, uh, operations. So uh, I think that these are aspects that, uh, in my view, uh, indicate that, uh, you know, the strategy review has been quite complete, you know, letting aside the question of climate change that I suppose that we can indicate some time well, afterwards. Well, well, thank you. But there's there's a lot to unpick there. Um, thank you for those members of the audience who are sending in questions already. Please do continue to do that. We'll get to questions from the audience in a moment. We've got a little panel who will be asking questions in about five to seven minutes as well. So there's, uh, there's plenty to come. I wanted to ask you, Luis, about some of those words in the statement. You seem to hedge in 
the recipe for action with lots of words. You use the words like uh, proportionality analysis. Uh, you said that uh, uh, you can only really take this forceful action if there's reaction to large adverse shocks. And you also kept using the word appropriate everywhere. Does this indicate mm -hmm. that the governing council is actually taking a pretty conservative line when it comes to using uh, unconventional policy instruments in an almost routine way. Is there still a big aversion in the council to turning those unconventional instruments into something conventional? Well, uh, you know, I I, I, I I don't agree. You know, you have to look at, you know, decisions that we took at the beginning of the of the pandemic, no? And, uh, you know, PPP, PPP was an extraordinary uh, program with, uh, you know, uh, a big size, a big envelope. Uh, it was long, so we reacted uh, forcefully, uh, rapidly, uh, according to the situation. No, so uh, I do not preclude that uh, you know we are uh, a sort of conservative approach with respect to the instruments. Uh, I think that's the other way, the, the other way around. I think that what we are doing with uh, you know the new strategy review is to say that uh, what it was uh, uh, unconventional only some few uh, a few years ago. Now, uh, you know, these instruments are becoming more and more uh, 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 conventional and orthodox in our toolkit. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this is a very clear conclusion. Uh, and I think that it was part of the, of the, of the consensus that we, we reached, that uh, every bit uh, it was reached with unanimity by all the members of the Governing Council. But a lot of people are saying now that you've got the inflation outlook for the next couple of years, as you said right at the very beginning, uh, there is some upside potential, but there's also a lot of slack in the economy. Your uh, inflation potential, uh, you seem to be saying for uh, 2022, 2023, is still only 1.4, 1.5%. That is below the now symmetrical 2% target. A lot of people are saying, why aren't you doing more in that case to get inflation up now? to up to and beyond the two percent if you do have all these different instruments at your disposal why don't you indicate that you're going to use them more forcefully and more persistently well we are doing quite a lot huh? you know i referred to before to to, to uh, you know to pep you know to our emergency program we are uh, you know we continue having long-term refinancing operations that have uh, you know a huge volume in terms of uh, you know uh, of uh, uh, liquidity for the European the European banks with some conditions attached, but in very good uh, you know financial conditions, and afterwards, uh, well, our forward guidance was uh, was uh, was there. So I would not say that we have not done uh, quite a lot. I think that the question of inflation is going to be very 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 relevant. I think that my 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 view is that uh, well, we are going to see you know. An increase, a clear increase in the evolution of inflation in 2021 this year. Um, I think that uh, the main reason behind uh, uh, is, uh, you know, the, the comparison with 2020. In 2020, a lot of things happened that could give rise, uh, you know, to a sort of distortion in terms of the comparison. Uh, in 2022, next year, we expect that these base effects that are going to, to, to push inflation up in 2021. Will be will be reverted, and that we will start to see you know a decline in inflation because of uh, you know the evolution of the base effects and the reversion of the base effects that uh, you know uh, now are uh, pushing up inflation in 2021. Nevertheless, uh, you know, and this is something that is uh, that is relevant. I have to say that uh, you know forecasting inflation is not easy. It's perhaps you know the most difficult economic macroeconomic variable to forecast. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we have been uh, overestimating, overestimating uh, inflation. And I think that uh, because in the case of inflation, there are a lot of, uh, let's say, global uh, components that influence the evolution of inflation and the structural ones. Huh? For instance, globalization, uh, internet, demographics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So um, I think that we have to be careful uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. You know, there is something that has not been changed because is included in the in the treaty. We have our primary target is price stability. Now with a new definition that I think that is much better than the previous one. But price stability continues to be eh, our main uh, main uh, aim and our main main. Yes, main well, I I understand that. Um, just a question which has come in actually from the audience, which is um, relevant here. Uh, as a result of the monetary policy, the strategy review, will you actually change your definition of over the medium term? In fact, what do you understand by the medium term, Luis? 
Well, normally, you know, over the medium term is the, you know, the time horizon of our projections. It depends, you know, between two and a half and three years. That's, uh, you know, if you, if you see, you know, the time horizon of our projections, it covers, uh, you know, until the end of, uh, of uh, 23, you know. So depending on what part, uh, you know, what month of the year you are, then uh, you have, uh, you know, between two and a half and three years, depending. If you are in January hmm, of 21, then it's almost three years. But has that are, changed now? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, and it, that has not uh, changed, you know, that, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, we normally do. Um, and uh, you have to bear in mind as well that, uh, you know, for instance, you know, many of the, of the, uh, of our projections are on average terms. Huh? So uh, you do not compare with the last month of the year, you know, for instance, inflation is always on average huh? and uh, growth, uh, growth as well. So I could not be, you know, so precise as to say, you know, when, uh, you know, what they, of, uh, you know, what month, uh, of what year, <laughs> well, the year is clear, huh? but uh, the day and the month, I think that is a little bit, uh, you know, more oh, on, oh, average, oh, on average change. terms, on average terms. You know, we are but, not, and what, nobody is so precise huh, as to say, you know, what day huh, and what month, huh, you know, the, the target and the forecast, uh, you know. Uh, all, all right, well, that may, maybe that's very wise. Just one more question from me, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Vincent Reinhardt, who's going to put a question, but question from me, is on the PEPP. Uh, that seems to be a, a major decision that you will very likely have to take uh, in the months after September, the idea on possibly prolonging the PEPP or possibly, as is the uh, idea at the moment, bringing it to an end at the end of March. And therefore, what would it be replaced by? Do you think that the agreement we've had on the strategy review is just a prelude to a much bigger decision which will take place in September on prolonging the PEPP or not prolonging it? And what do you think that decision will be? Well, first of all, you know, I, uh, let, me, let me stress that the strategy review goes clearly beyond PEPP. It's going to be something that uh, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be there for, for, for years, not for four for months. We have decided that in 25, we will uh, we will have an assessment It'll be there for three years anyway. Yes, yeah. but it will be you know a preliminary preliminary assessment of uh, you know the study review. So I would not uh, link it to to the decision that we will take with respect to PPP. But let me say something. First of all, you know we have not discussed uh, you know the transit uh, from PPP to other to other programs. Uh, the governing council uh, will uh, will decide in the in the in the near future. Second, uh, you know, I will stress and I will emphasize, emphasize uh, in my view, uh, something that is uh, relevant, that PPP is a transitory program, hmm? it's an emergency program that is uh, linked to the pandemic and the, the economic consequences of the pandemic. Uh, third, that, uh, you know, there is a recovery underway. This is quite obvious, but the recovery is fragile, hmm? as uh, the G20 has indicated, and, uh, you know, there are uncertainties around and finally, uh, well, uh, mm, you know, a big uh, deal of accommodation will be needed in the in the future, huh? uh, because, as I have said before, huh, uh, you know, the recovery is underway, but uh, it's fragile, and so we will we will we'll need to maintain favorable financing conditions huh, uh, for the next months. And finally, uh, the withdrawal of uh, the, the, the fiscal and monetary stimuli uh, have to be, the, has to be, you know, very prudent, very, very gradual and should not be premature. So the conditions are still not in place for you really to be able to decide on this, but let's say you do end the PEPP on time. Will it have to be replaced by another instrument which will also bring in the much vaunted flexibility uh, across jurisdictions, across asset classes and across durations? Is that a necessary condition for anything which might come the, the son or daughter of PEPP in the future after March? Well, uh, I repeat again, the PPP is an emergency and transitory program. Uh, but uh, you know the, the, the evolution of the of the of the of the pande pandemic will determine you know the conditions uh, of our monetary policy stance. So uh, uh, what I can what what I can stress and I would like to emphasize is that uh, you know uh, an accommodative monetary po policy will be in place uh, yeah, over the next. Uh, okay, well that, the, that's fair uh, enough. Thank, the thank, term. 
But uh, we have not discussed, uh, you know, the concrete details about, uh, you know, the transition from PPP to any other program, PSPP or our uh, asset purchase program. Th th thank you for uh, making that clear. My own favourite is the is the post pandemic purchase program, the PPPP. <laughs> but we'll see anyway. Now, could I ask Vincent Reinhardt? Uh, to put your question, Vincent is the chief economist and macro strategist at Mellon Investments. Over to you, Vincent. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for taking the time. You mentioned, uh, Mr. Vice President, the effective lower bound to nominal policy interest rates uh, several times. Did the strategy review uh, uh, discuss where that is? And in retrospect, do you think a negative policy rate uh, is all it's cut out to be? Well, uh, you know, I think that these are very good questions. Now, with respect to the lower lower bound, uh, well, uh, um, you know, uh, the natural interest rate, as you know much better than myself, is not uh, is not uh, let's say you know a, a visible huh, microeconomic variable. You know, it's something that you have to guess, you have to calculate according to models. Uh, there is something that is quite clear. You know, there is a decline of the natural interest rate over time over the last. Uh, 20 years, let's call it that way, because there are, you know, some structural factors behind. And now, uh, well, uh, you know, depending on the models, but, uh, you know, the conclusion is very clear. The conclusion is that, uh, you know, it's much lower than it used to be 10, 15 years ago. And that is close to, 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 to zero. Hmm? So that's, uh, you know, our guess, but, uh, you know, you do not have a concrete, uh, you know, uh, uh, gauge, concrete uh, calibration of uh, you know the natural the natural interest 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 rate so that's uh, you know the first point and uh, i think that is something that is quite obvious we are we, we, the reason why we are using unconventional monetary policy instruments is because we are in the lower the lower bound or that uh, you know the natural interest rates have been, has been declining over 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 time and so uh, mm, um, uh, you know uh, this uh, implies that what uh, we used to 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 define as an uh, an orthodox or unconventional uh, uh, monetary policy instruments now you know they are becoming much more much more much more conventional and for sure that uh, you know they are part of our toolkit and we are very clear that uh, besides uh, you know the proportionality analysis that we will implement over time you know we will continue using this kind this kind of unconventional monetary instruments that I would define as uh, much more orthodox and conventional than uh, 10 years ago the other question was about in negative interest rates wasn't it so well you know negative interest rates uh, you know it was one of the instruments that we use this part of our of our toolkit uh, but we believe that uh, uh, asset purchases of long-term refinancing uh, instruments are much more powerful and forward guidance much more powerful, powerful now than uh, 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 negative interest rates are much more convenient uh, to be used uh, in the present circumstances. So, so can, can we rule out totally further cuts in the negative interest rates? Can we just put that out of our minds now? Well, <laughs> I would not say that. <laughs> it's an instrument that is available, but, uh, you know, today we are using what we are using and we are using... Uh, asset purchases and long-term refinancing conditions. Huh? Okay, okay, thank you. If, on, on to the next question. Uh, Marco Stringer, Chief Economist of Element Capital, who happens to come from the winning side last night in the football. Congratulations, Marco, <laughs> and please put your question. Hi, David. Uh, sorry, thank you, David, and, and uh, thank you for, for the call, uh, Mr. Vice President. Going back, uh, chiming on what um, David said before, uh, I have to say I'm... I'm in the camp of those who give a positive review of the strategy or the strategy review. And I was in a panel the other day and one pushback I did not answer uh, is the following, uh, I'm sure you will do a better job than I did, is uh, the, um, the ECB, as David says, got uh, um, long-term long -term inflation projections, uh, medium-term well below target, long-term inflation expectations are below target, all of these looks worse in the United States where the Fed went for um, average inflation targeting. And what we expect and what the market expectation are is that the CB first will reduce the PEP uh, uh, pace uh, in September and then sometimes next year it will end up with that. So how does all of this not under undermine the credibility of the current strategy review? You raise your target, 
and you're gonna cut uh, stimulus when you are far away from reaching the target. Well, uh, but I think that uh, your, your question is a little bit biased because I think that there is another element that is quite relevant is the evolution of the economy and the normalization of the economy. Uh, let's suppose that uh, you know we 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 uh, uh, we continue with the recovery and the recovery on their way uh, gains momentum and gains strength, uh, and then uh, you know we will have a normalization of the economy and we are data dependent. So uh, I could not link uh, uh, our new definition of price stability of two percent symmetric medium term with. Uh, you know the decisions that we are going to take with respect to PEP over the next uh, over the next uh, months. Huh? I think that uh, you have to link it uh, mainly to the evolution of the of the of the of the economy. And uh, next week we will we will discuss uh, you know our new forward guidance. Huh? Um, is something that uh, well uh, at least uh, you know the formulation of the forward guidance has to be modified in order uh, to, to to include the new definition of price stability. Our definition, well, if, uh, if I remember correctly, I think that our forward guidance uh, speaks that we will keep, uh, you know, interest rates at the present level or even lower until we have robust convergence towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the close but below 2%. Uh, I think that automatically, you know, that formulation, and this will be a minimalistic, a minimalistic change, uh, will go to 2% uh, symmetric in, over the medium term. And let's see, because uh, you know, I, I don't discard that we can have, you know, some some additional changes in the forward guidance. But it's something that we will discuss uh, next uh, next uh, next. Okay, week. We, we we will watch out for that. Uh, just before going over to the next question, which is from Julian Kello, could I just put a supplementary question to Marcos, please, Mr. De Guindos? And and that is, could fiscal policy make all the difference? I noticed Christine Lagarde last week. Um, noted that unlike in the past, uh, the fiscal authorities are maintaining uh, fiscal stimulants. There'll be a fiscal stimulus in the EU area of something like 4% this year. Deficits are going to be 7% of GDP, despite the recovery. Uh, that plus the new generation fund, could that make all the difference uh, to push the inflation rate up to 2% and beyond? So it's not just monetary policy, it's fiscal policy. I think the fiscal policy has a very important play, a very important role to to to, to, to play. Uh, I go back to the question of the lower bound uh, because when you are you have very low interest rates, fiscal policy is very is much more powerful than in a in a in a context that you can have an increase in interest rates because uh, you do not have any sort of crowding out effect. And so, in that respect, I think that uh, the stabilization uh, 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 role of fiscal policy. In, in this crisis, I think that is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite obvious. So uh, I hope that fiscal policy will make uh, you know an important contribution in order to raise the natural interest rate uh, over time. And there is something that I would like to to, to refer uh, simultaneously. You know, once the pandemic is over, once uh, you know the the, 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 the fallout of, uh, uh, of the economic fallout of the of the pandemic uh, has been has been uh, you know uh, 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 made up and compensated. And then, uh, well, countries will have to, 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 to look at uh, fiscal sustainability over medium term, because there is one consequence of uh, you know, the pandemic that is totally inevitable. That is that uh, the public debt ratio uh, has gone up, uh, is going up, and that uh, you know, sometimes you know, we should not focus so much on the average. Uh. In economics, uh, you know, the dispersion, uh, the, uh, the standard deviation sometimes is as important as the average, and we'll have, you know, more uh, disparities among countries in terms of fiscal positions. And this is something that for sure will come to the fore once the pandemic is over. Yes, and, and sorry, I didn't quite hear you when you said the fiscal spending will, did you say it will push up the interest rate or it will push up the inflation rate? I didn't quite understand. No, it that. will push up, you know, the, the, the natural interest rate, the natural yes. interest rate, and as well, you know, the inflation for sure, because it's when yes. you have, you know, a positive contribution to aggregate demand. Hmm? Indeed. So Julian Kello, who's a member of the OMFIV network. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much uh, for, for the very interesting uh, comments. I had a couple of questions. Uh, the first is concerning uh, the so-called pecking order. Uh, Mr. de Grindosia, you mentioned a uh, pecking order uh, and you had the uh, longer term refinancing operations last 
uh, in that. And I noticed that Madame Lagarde, uh, speaking on Thursday, also referred to a pecking order uh, and also had uh, the Taucho operations uh, last. Uh, is the pecking order suggests an order of preference. And so uh, is it correct to assume that th these are now the, the least favoured uh, tool of, of the ECB? Secondly, I'd be interested uh, in how concerned uh, you would be if uh, with the ECB's uh, forecast coming out in September and December, uh, that the end point is still well under 2% uh, inflation at the moment. Uh, the end point for 2023 is 1.4% 1 uh, inflation. It's a long way to go uh, to 2%. To uh, so I, I imagine you're calling here really for average euro area wage inflation to be at least 3% uh, in order to deliver uh, that at least 2% uh, over the, the longer term, which uh, it seems that, that you need. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for the two questions. First of all, with respect to the pecking order, the parking order uh, what I have to say is that, uh, you know, there is nothing uh, intentional. <laughs> well, you know, our main instrument is the, the, the modification of, uh, of uh, interest rates, of the range of interest rates that we have at our disposal. And afterwards, we have other instruments um, that, uh, that uh, I would not put them, you know, in a, in a sort of hierarchy eh, in terms of uh, alternatives to the modification of interest rates. So, if uh, the president of myself, we refer to the Teltros as the, the last one, you know, it was uh, um, uh, the, the perhaps you know the last but not least of our of our of our instruments. So you know, uh, it's something that we can we can combine, and we are not going to. We do not have a, you know an internal let's say uh, 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 a second derivative uh, uh, pecking order uh, for other instruments besides uh, uh, the modification of interest rates. And with respect to you know the the the, the two percent again, uh, let me say something. You know, I am repeating uh, our 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 central scenario is very clear. We are going to have you know an inflation that is going to move up towards three percent uh, uh, at year end, uh, and because of the base effects, it's going to decline uh, in 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 twenty twenty two. And uh, if you look at uh, core inflation. You can realize that uh, you know our projections of core inflations are clearly uh, 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 on the rise, huh? and uh, you know they they they. So uh, our core inflation, for instance, for 2023 is 1.4. It's identical to the to the headline inflation, and that's because we have you know an assumption about the evolution of oil prices. So uh, forecasting is always based uh, on assumptions that sometimes are right and sometimes are wrong. So. Uh, you know, I, I want to put, uh, you know, I always put, uh, you know, a cautious note with respect to, to forecasting inflation. Uh, mm, and, uh, you know, I said something, you know, in my introductory remarks. We have to look at second round effects very carefully. So far, we have not seen uh, anything uh, in the labor in the labor market. But there are some economies in the Euro area that uh, indexation is there. Huh? And that uh, if indexation, you know, plays a role, Perhaps what is temporary can become more permanent, permanent over time, much more structural over time. But and this if, is something that we will, are going If you will to forgive me for interrupting, uh, Luis, surely what Julian is saying is that shouldn't you be encouraging higher inflation in some way in order to get to your target, higher wage inflation? Should you not be encouraging some degree of uh, trade union militancy so that they will actually ask for higher wage raises I, and, and I don't think that target. that's uh, that's uh, our role at all you know is uh, is part of the social partners and uh, uh, you know uh, I, I, I I really respect uh, you know uh, your 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 views that uh, about uh, how powerful and how almighty a central bank is but I can assure you that uh, you know, there are there are some areas that uh, we do not uh, we do not have uh, you know the capacity to have a big influence there. Hmm? All, all, all right. So de-anchoring <laughs> inflation expectations doesn't go so far as to encourage unions to put in higher wage demands. So that's that's important. Well, you know, this is a conclusion that you have you have done uh, <laughs> on your own. What I say is that uh, you know the they, 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 you know the inflation expectations are there. You know, are quite stable. You know. Uh, around 1.6, 1.7 over the next two years. So uh, I suppose that economic agents, uh, you know, will, will adjust their behavior to these inflation expectations.
Okay, well, let's have the next question, please, from uh, Bill, Bill Paradakis, who's a macro strategist at Banque Lombard Oudier. Bill, your question, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity, David, and thank you for your time, Mr. Vice President. So a key um, element that was perhaps not as prominent as I would have expected in the strategy review was some specific emphasis on the various tools in the box. So for instance, and going back to negative rates, there are different types of them. And we have negative rates, negative deposit rates, where the existence of a lower bound is pretty clear and we're probably not far from it. But then there are also negative rates on LTRO operations where they can be lower and still possibly have a stimulative effect. So I'm, I'm curious to think about, um, to ask about how the ECB thinks uh, about using the two different negative uh, rate variables and how is it going to assess the possible side effects and the benefits uh, of each of them? Thank you. Well, you're totally right. We have a range uh, of interest rates, and uh, you know some of them are more negative than 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 than, than others. But we have not discussed uh, anything with respect to negative rates. Even you know even the negative. I think that now the conditions for the teltrosis are very positive for the for the for the for the banks, and uh, you know they have uh, introduced uh, a lot of uh, accommodation and have given rise uh, to, you know, to, to 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 a lot of uh, lending by by the European the European banks. So we have not discussed uh, the modification of the conditions of the of the of the of the Teltros. We are happy with uh, the impact that uh, Teltros uh, have had uh, in terms of uh, borrowing and lending, uh, and uh, you know we have avoided uh, you know a, a credit crunch. That's something that is quite obvious. And if you look at uh, you know financial conditions in the credit market, I think that uh, you know they are quite stable and continue to be in favorable. Uh, for uh, you know, for for households, for corporates, etc., etc., etc. But we have not discussed. That that's why you know we have not discussed any modification of the parameters of the telcos so far. Just on that question of financial conditions, if I may just step in with a supplementary, the June the tenth minute seemed to show that there was a body of opinion on the governing council that said that financial conditions had actually improved. Not only that they remained favourable, that they had improved between March and June. Where would you say you come out in that debate, please, Luis? Well, I think that, uh, uh, you know, because uh, there were different, uh, you know, uh, you can refer to real rates, uh, to nominal rates, uh, uh, this kind uh, this kind of discussions always, uh, you know, appear, no? But I think that, uh, you know, my personal view is that uh, financing, financing conditions has been, have been uh, 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 quite stable over time, and they remain and they are, uh, you know, favorable in my in my view, and they continue to be favorable in my view, regardless okay. of whether you know. Because uh, normally, uh, you know, to calculate, uh, well, first of all, uh, I think that real rates matter not only, you know, weekly basis. Well, you know, I think that you need uh, you need to have, you know, a longer uh, uh, period of reference uh, because, uh, well, uh, decisions on consumption or investment are not taken only on uh, how you know real rates have evolved over the last uh, two days uh, sometimes there is something that uh, you know uh, we, we we overlook and i think that in my view is quite quite relevant we are talking continuously about favorable financing conditions but i think that is our role the role of the of the ecb to maintain uh, uh, you know favorable financing conditions but we are not talking so much about the productivity of capital and the return on uh, you know capital in the in the in the in the euro area, and uh, well, uh, return on capital and the productivity of capital will depend on other kind of structural policies that are, are not in the hands of the of the central banks that you can you can you can you can imagine. So, uh, a decision uh, on investment on capital expenditure will look at both uh, elements, uh, financing okay. conditions Lots and the things. and the productivity the productivity of capital, and I think that uh, you know. That's why you know the part of uh, structural reforms included, uh, you know, in the in the in the in the national programs uh, related to the recovery fund are so relevant in my view. Lots of things to look at there. We've got quite a lot of questions still coming in from the audience, and I've got one more here now from Catherine Nice, who's the chief European economist at Pigeon. Catherine, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question. 
Uh, my question sort of builds, I think, a bit on, on Julian's uh, question. So having brought the framework review to a completion, what does good look like from the perspective of the governing council in three years time? So I'm thinking in particular of these staff economic projections in December, we'll get 2024, we'll be able to look out uh, over that medium term horizon. What, what, what does good look like for the governing council and, and what sort of metrics will the governing council be looking at in real time to judge whether or not they're on track? Thank you so much. Well, you know, uh, let's. Uh, I think that uh, you know, after after summer, we will have more more information. That's quite clear with respect to the impact of uh, you know the, the the variant of the of the of the virus that uh, now is the main risk that we are confronting and that we are going to confront. I think that we will have uh, as well more information about uh, how fiscal policy is going to 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 be pursued in in twenty 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 two. Uh, we will have, you know, more information about the evolution of uh, of, uh, of inflation. Well, we will have, you know, a, you know, a range of new indicators, and uh, that uh, we do not have available now. So I would not prejudge what we are going to do in December. Um, I think that you know a key component is going to be the evolution of uh, of uh, uh, oil prices and commodity prices. I think that as well, uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility of disruptions in the supply chain and the possibility of bottlenecks and how you know, this, uh, you know, the, the world economy uh, is addressing this kind of uh, disruptions is something that is going to be relevant. There are, there are a range uh, of elements that we will take into, into, into consideration no? and that, that will have an impact on our, on our, on our projections. No? But uh, again, uh, you know, I repeat something that is, uh, is relevant. In our, present, in our present projections, inflation projections, there is an increase of uh, core inflation, of underlying inflation, until 1.4. And the reason why you know, headline inflation doesn't go to 1.4 is because we have uh, a, a, pro a projection about the evolution of oil, of, of oil prices, according to forward uh, because it's something that we do not uh, we do not invent uh, on our own. We use uh, you know the forward forward prices of oil, uh, but let's see how these kind of things uh, evolve. And let's see something that I said before. Let's see about uh, you know the evolution of second round effects. Uh, let's see. Now we have not seen you know any sort of second round effects in the in the in the in the in the labor market, but I think that uh, you know wage the wage bargaining process. Uh, will start uh, after after summer. Now we are not in the period of the wage bargain. Well, well, thank you, thank you for mentioning that. I, I think it's very important. I've got a question from the audience on inflation uh, from uh, Juan Castaneda. I'll read it out in the interest of time. Juan is from the University of Buckingham, and he's something of an inflation hawk, I might say. And he says that you've kept uh, a reference to the monetary pillar in your strategy. What is the current growth in the broad money figures telling us about inflation over the medium term? Well, the money supply is growing, you know, according to different measures. You have M1, M2, M3, you know, at a rate that, uh, you know, is close to double digits, as, as you know. But I think that, uh, you know, the, the link between the evolution of, uh, you know, money supply and inflation is uh, uh, is is quite weak. Uh, uh, it's something that uh, well, you know, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, you know, this uh, this link between uh, money supply and inflation has been weakened, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the correlation uh, is much more, let's say, limited than it was in the in the in the in the in the in the past. Hmm? Uh, I've got several questions about monetary policy, and then we'll go on to uh, uh, one or two questions about the climate issue uh, later on. Peter Chatwell from Mizzou um, says, given the fact that there's a big gap between your inflation forecast uh, and the actual symmetric 2% target, should you not then triple the APP in size uh, after March to explicitly reach the 2% target? Well, there are other factors, you know, as you know, perfectly affecting uh, the evolution of inflation and there are side effects. And so what we do continuously is a sort of proportionality analysis. So we take into consideration uh, um, other elements that, uh, you know, could, uh, could be impaired if, uh, you know, our monetary policy were not proportional. 
Are, are you using the word proportional now much, much more, Louise, you and the other members of the executive board, since the German Constitutional Court told you to be more proportional in their ruling last May, or, or do you do that all the time anyway? I, I can assure you that uh, proportion, proportional and proportionality has been part of our jargon, even, uh, you know, clearly way before, uh, you know, the ruling of the Constitutional Court. Oh, well, thank you. I've got a question from Patrick Flynn from the audience. He says, could you be more specific about how climate risk is now a consideration for, pu for future price stability? Because, of course, some methods of greening the economy could actually drive up prices. And also there's a lot of commodities now used in uh, catalysts and in mobile phones and technology and so on, which are all getting more expensive. So where does uh, climate risk come into in your uh, price stability forecast, please, Luis. Well, what we're going to do, you know, with respect to climate change, uh, you know, I think that is, uh, you know, I would refer to three elements. The first one is uh, the modification of our models in order to take into consideration, you know, the impact of uh, climate change and policies to fight climate change uh, uh, on uh, inflation and on, 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 on growth. This is something that is quite uh, quite obvious because we, we bear in mind that there is something that we have to bear in mind that you know, the main uh, line of defense against climate change is, uh, you know, the, is fiscal policy. Our policies, you know, implemented by governments, taxation, incentives, um, emission permits, this kind, this kind of things. So, uh, but, uh, you know, this could have, and this may have uh, an impact on inflation and, and growth. And this is something that we are going to put in our models. Second, you know, we are going to, to uh, you know, to, to, to have a continuous uh, uh, you know, over, over, over uh, uh, supervision of the impact of climate change on financial stability. In that respect, we will produce and we will release uh, our uh, climate stress test uh, results uh, uh, in, in September. And the main conclusion is that uh, uh, taking action today uh, is clearly superior in terms of the potential benefits in the medium term than, uh, you know, doing nothing. Hmm? Uh, in terms of welfare for the society, and not of, not only in terms of welfare for the society, in terms of uh, you know the solvency of corporates and the solvency of banks. So uh, to take decisions rapidly now uh, is clearly clearly beneficial. Um, uh, you can have you know costs, some costs in the short term, but the benefits that you 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 obtain you can reap in the medium term clearly are, are clearly superior to the costs in the in the short term. And finally, uh, well, the question of, uh, you know, disclosures and, uh, you know, the modification of our risk management, uh, let's say, uh, analysis in order to, to, to include, uh, you know, uh, environmental considerations uh, in our uh, asset purchases and in our collateral, collateral uh, framework. A question uh, now on inflation again. Um, that seems to be the favourite subject this morning. Um, if, if you were to think that the uh, level of consumer prices were feeding through also into asset prices, what would you do about it? And also linked to that, are you particularly worried about German inflation now being um, a percentage point ahead of the inflation in the rest of the euro area? German inflation will be 4% by the end of the year uh, in the euro area as a whole is 2.9%. Um, is that just a question of averaging, or do you think Germany should be treated with more sensitivity than other countries because they're bigger? Well, you know, the, the, the weight of Germany in the euro area is very clear. You know, it's the largest, the largest uh, economy. And so we, we, we look at uh, Germany with a lot of care and a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. But I think that in the case of Germany, perhaps, you know, is the most obvious case of having uh, base effects with a transitory, uh, with a transitory impact on, on, on inflation in 2021. And the reason is because they, they reduced uh, VAT in the second half of 2020. And, uh, you know, this base effect is quite to, to be, you know, quite, quite obvious. If you look at, uh, you know, the projections of the Bundesbank, they are quite clear with respect to the German, German inflation. And they are taken into consideration because, uh, well, Germany is a little bit more than 20% of the GDP of the euro area. And so we have, uh, you know, we, it's something that we include in our own uh, uh, projections for the whole uh, euro area overall. 
good. I want to ask you in the final five minutes on questions about banking union uh, and also a question has come in about the digital euro. Uh, we've been talking about banking union now for six or seven years. We don't seem to be much closer to the uh, deposit insurance scheme to Europeanize that. That's taken a further setback, unfortunately, about 10 days ago. What needs to be put in place, would you say, in order to make banking union complete? And do we need to actually get rid of this sovereign loop, uh, sovereign bank uh, nexus before we can go on to the next stage of banking union, which has to be uh, a unified European deposit insurance scheme? Well, I think that uh, the common insurance deposit scheme, what we call, uh, you know, EDC is something that is key, uh, uh, you know, with ECB, we will have always defended and we will continue defending, uh, defending uh, the need of uh, uh, EDC as uh, the third pillar of the banking union. We will not have a bank, complete banking union without uh, 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 EDC. And I think that uh, in that respect, uh, you know, the delay or the postponement that uh, that you have indicated uh, uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago with respect to the implementation of it this is not good news in our in our in our in our view because uh, well uh, we need uh, you know a complete banking union that is going to be part of uh, you know the whole uh, uh, architecture of the of emu and without that uh, i think that uh, you know we cannot talk about uh, you know a complete uh, a complete monetary and economic union in the euro area. So I hope that, uh, you know, once, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the electoral uh, calendar uh, is uh, much more clear uh, than now, uh, uh, I think that I hope that, uh, you know, we will be able to, to make progress in that. Uh, in that do, uh, do you think that Mr. Laschet in Germany will be pushing that through? Well, no, 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 no. What I think is that, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, well, you know, the political calendar has an influence on the decisions, in, uh, you know, because these are political decisions at the end of the day. So uh, uh, to have, uh, you know, a clear horizon, uh, you know, in some countries uh, in terms of elections and in terms of, uh, you know, new governments is something that is, is quite relevant. Huh? for this kind of decisions. Okay, we've got time for just two more questions. Now, one is on the digital euro. We've had several questions on this. Uh, do you think that it's necessary to have a digital euro to stand up to the uh, Chinese competition in the digital currency area? And, and if so, when do you think a digital euro will actually come into place? I know you're having another conclave on this very soon. Well, with respect to the digital euro, it's not to compete with, uh, you know, private uh, digital uh, currencies uh, at all or with, uh, you know, the Chinese. I think that uh, digitalization is a, is a process, is taking place, is a reality, and so we'll, we'll have to deliver. I think that, uh, you know, the main, the main uh, difference of, uh, you know, the euro digital or any uh, CBDC or uh, uh, central bank uh, digital money is that, uh, you know, a central bank is involved because, well, we are doing a lot of transactions uh, uh, that are digital uh, uh, now. When, whenever you pay with a credit card, when you, you transfer uh, money using your, your, your smartphone or your iPad, well, something that uh, is, is digital by, 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 by definition. And I think that, uh, you know, here the important component is, uh, you know, that uh, a central bank is involved. Uh, not only the ECB, but uh, you know all the all the central banks of uh, of the of the of the world, and what I think is that we should look at uh, the potential financial stability implications. This is going to be extremely important. Well, uh, well also because, the business the business models of the banks maybe also needs to be taken into account. For sure, uh, you know it's something that you know is uh, that's the main financial stability consideration. Now yes. deposits. Uh, are the, 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 the main source of funding of uh, the European the European banks. And so uh, we should be careful that, uh, you know, this kind of changes do not give rise to any sort of disruption. Well, well, well thank you. That's very important. Just time for one more question. We're overshooting slightly. This is from Krishna Guha, a typical Krishna Guha question. How do you personally weigh the merits of outcome-based guidance to set an inflation threshold for raising rates in order to increase the credibility of your new strategy? <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we are going to have, you know, a lot of uh, very imaginative and creative, uh, you know, contributions, but for sure that we will take into consideration, but at the end of the day, for sure, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I repeat what I said at the beginning. This is about evolution, no revolution in terms of monetary policy 
uh, uh, implementation. Well, 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 thank you for being part of this evolution today, uh, Lewis, and thank you to all the questioners. I think we've got a, through a record number of questions, must be about 25 different questions we've had here, and you've done very well in answering them all. We hope to see you in person, uh, either in Frankfurt or in Madrid before too I long. I hope so. I hope uh, so. And, and we look forward to this, but I think this is the next best thing uh, to uh, an in-person call. Uh, thank you for being so open. Thank you for being so succinct as well. It's been a delight to talk to you. And may I congratulate Spain for being actually the best team in the Euro Championships. You were better than <laughs> Italy, even though you lost on penalties. Uh, England were worse than Italy and we lost on penalties. So there's something that unites us all. But in football and in life, uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, the score is the, the key element. Huh? That's right. And the key difference. <laughs> you can play very well, but if you if you don't score, then you have a problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. The, it the, the core score, doesn't it? Thank you very much indeed. And look forward to the next opportunity to talk to you, Luis de Guindos. Thank you, everybody, Thank you for much. asking so many good questions. This is David.